Hi, welcome to Kilns and Firing. Hopefully at the end of this presentation, you're going to be able to say that you can recognize the existence of different types of kilns, explain the difference made by different types of atmospheres, describe how the cone works in a kiln setter, and explain the basics of kiln firing. These are two questions that kind of start everything. What is a kiln? Why fire pottery? So what is a kiln? Basically, a kiln is just an oven used for firing clay. This can look like a lot of different things. Um, it's not really an oven, don't call it an oven, but it's basically that. And I'll show you a variety of different kilns um, that are used throughout the world for the purpose of firing, firing clay. So why fire pottery? Well, without firing, unfired clay is not very durable. It breaks very easily, as some of you have found and it can be dissolved in water no longer no, no matter how long it's actually been sitting around. Fired clay is more durable while it's still fragile and can still be broken not nearly so easily. It also cannot be dissolved in water so it's impervious to water. There are also different things that you can do um, depending on what type of firing you use or the temperatures you use. You can get different types of finishes or aesthetic um, aspects to your pieces depending on what you're doing. They can look very different depending on the type of firing or the type of kilns that you use, including the different types of fuel. Which leads us to this. So what type of fuel can be used for a kiln? You probably you know, may not be aware that there's actually a broad range of fuel types for kilns. It basically fits into two different categories, the first of which is combustible fuels that actually create flame. Those fuels could be solid, liquid, or gas combustibles. Um, it really depends on where in the world you're making pottery and whether you're still doing traditional types of firings or whether you're going for a more modern type of firing. So here are some examples of types of combustible materials. If you are doing very traditional firing, you may be using wood, dried grasses, or dried dung. Um, regardless of the type of combustible, obviously it needs to be a dry material. If you're using newspaper or sawdust, you're probably using um, doing a raku process and that creates a totally different look. If you're using fuel oil or propane or maybe even coal, you may be firing in a slightly more modern method. Now this is not an exhaustive list, it's not everything that can be used. These are just some of the um, combustible materials. If you're doing a non-combustible, you're probably doing electric. That's pretty much your option there. And that's what we use. We use an electric kiln. There is no fire, even though we still call it firing, uh, but there's actually no fire involved. Now, if you look at Maria Martinez, if you look at her pottery, um, this is an example of one. It's considered to be a black on black pottery, and it's got a glossy black and a dull black. There's no glaze on this. This is all just with slips and the surface of her clay. Her clay is burnished down, which rubbed down, which makes the glossy part. And then you can either carve away or add um, slip. Generally, it's brushed on slip over it. And wherever that slip is applied, that's going to be the matte black. And this is usually fired with dried dung. Um, and it's fired in, in a way that the smoke builds up and it actually changes the surface quality of the pot. It actually turns it dark. So this is not black clay nor black glaze. It looks this way because of the way it's fired and the fuel type that's used. Dung. We could not get that look in our electric kilns without using glazes. And that also leads us then to the atmosphere. There are basically three types of kiln atmospheres. Um, they all are related to the presence of one particular element. Can you guess what it is? Oxygen. Um, the presence of oxygen or the lack of oxygen is basically what changes colors of both the clay and certain glazes um, depending on how much oxygen is there. Those three types of kiln atmospheres include oxygen, where there is more oxygen than the fuel needs, neutral, just enough oxygen for the flames to burn for the amount of fuel being used, or reduction, there's less oxygen than what the fuel needs. 
In a reduction atmosphere, the combustion actually removes the oxygen in the clay body and the, clay, the glaze ingredients, and it changes the way it looks. For example, that's especially true about copper oxide, which I'll show you. Um, so when it removes that oxygen from the very surface of the clay or the glaze, it changes the colors. Here's a slide that shows some examples of Raku results. This is an example of a Raku kiln when it's open. The pots are still red hot, kind of orangey. And they're taken out with tongs. And you can see someone's lifting out this particular pot with a pair of tongs. And then they're placed into a trash can filled with sawdust or newspaper, something combustible. And it's still hot enough, so they take it out of this kiln, place it in this kiln, and it's still hot enough that it will ignite the combustible in this kiln. This is most likely, um, it could be electric, but most likely it's a gas-fired kiln. And it's, um, it's probably a neutral atmosphere, and then placed in the trash can, which is a reduction atmosphere. Um, once they put the lid on, it continues to burn until the oxygen is used up. And the glaze may craze or crackle, which is what's happened here. This actually happens, if you look really closely at some of your pots when they come out of our kiln, you may see all this tiny, tiny little crazing, this kind of spider webbing effect. But it's not going to be as dramatic because it's in an oxidation atmosphere. But in the reduction atmosphere, those all turn black. The um, clay underneath turns black. And in here you can see that the inside of the pot is black. That's not glaze. And this is not glaze either. That's just where the clay is exposed and it turns gray or black. Same way here. Now it also changes the color of the glaze, especially if it's a copper-based uh, copper glaze. This glaze color probably did not change. This is actually probably, or it could be a white glaze, it could be a clear glaze, but it looks white now because of the black crackles. Now this glaze, this is a copper matte, and that copper glaze could be a green, it could turn bright red, it could turn orangey, or actually could turn metallic copper. So any glazes with copper oxide or copper in it, um, it could be copper oxide or copper carbonate, but it can change the color of the results of that glaze. It's really kind of magical. So you can get a wide range of colors if you're using a reduction atmosphere in your firings. Again, this is not possible in our indoor electric kiln. Here are some examples of combustion type kilns. We've got a gas kiln. This is the um, a fancy Raku kiln. We've got a beehive kiln that most likely is wood fired. Um, this is a wood fired kiln. Fire boxes over here. We've got the chimney. Um, we've got a wood um, it's kind of a fire uh, kiln, a uh, pit kiln or just a mound um, with dried combustible materials piled around it. You start out with your pots and then you stack again whatever dried material you're using, whether it's sticks, dried grasses, or dung. And then you hope there's no big winds while you're firing it can crack all your pots. This is basically just a slightly more evolved version of this, except now it's going to be able to hold that heat in and not be um, in danger of big winds kicking up and having dramatic changes in temperature. But these are all combustible type kilns. These are electric kilns. We've got a square top loader, a round top loader, much like the ones we've got in back, and then a front loading electric kiln. Now this electric kiln, you can see that it's got all these coils down the side. That's what heats it up to make it hot. Um, in the gas kiln, you don't see that. You see the spaces between the brick, um, but there are no electric kilns. You just got the spaces where the gas burners are. This is just an example of using bricks to make a kiln that will fire bricks. If you go to Colonial Williamsburg or if you've been there, you may have watched the brick makers. They're actually making, uh, mixing up clay. He's making the bricks back there. After they make the bricks, they let them dry, and then they load them into this brick kiln, and then they close over with more bricks, seal that up, and then build fires in these little chambers, and it can fire for days. Electric kilns usually fire less than a day. Um, they may take a full day to cool, but they only take a day or less. Um, usually it's, 
it's 10 to 20 hours depending on the size of the kiln um, but some combustible kilns may take days or a week to fire depending on how big um, and the type of kiln and the type of combustible being used so it can be quite a process if you're using a very modern kiln um, much like our electric kilns, you're going to probably have kiln furniture. So in case you're wondering how I get more than just a single layer into a kiln, I use kiln furniture. I've got posts and I put a shelf in and I stack that, put pots on there. And again, the bisque firing, they can touch each other in a glazed load. They cannot touch anywhere except where they're sitting on the base. And then you put more posts in, another shelf, more pieces. And all of your pieces should be half inch to an inch away from anything surrounding it except again, of course, it's going to be sitting down. And then we've got kiln wash here. The kiln wash is used to apply to the shelves so that if glaze drips, it sticks to the kiln wash and not the shelf. Now electric kilns are able to use kiln sitters. And that's what's shown here, here, and here. If you look on our kilns in the back, it's got this, this uh, kiln sitter on it. And this is the cloth. This is the, the little panel that drops down. Inside, we've got this sensing rod right there, and this is this is the tube that actually holds the sensing rod, and it's got the two little fingers there that hold the junior cone. This little finger goes on top. When the cone melts, the little sensing rod finger drops down, and when that drops down, this little panel drops, and it releases that little white button. When that happens, it turns the kiln off. Now, if there were something in there that, that fell against any of these and made it so it did not turn off right. There's also this backup timer. Um, used to be when they first started these, it was just the timer and you hoped you had it right. And then there was um, the kiln sitter here and then this was more of just a backup. Um, and before this, you had to be there and you had to actually look at the witness cones that you had placed right in front of the little holes. And when the cone in the center drooped. These are three different cones. Um, one, this is a lower firing. This is the firing you're, or the cone you're hoping for, and this is a higher firing cone. So when the middle one droops down, you know that that's the right temperature, and you would shut off your kiln. This is still used in gas kilns, um, and occasionally you put these in just to check and make sure your your electric kiln is firing properly. Oops but this is what actually turns off um, your kiln if you've got a kiln sitter on an electric kiln. Unless you've got a more modern electric kiln, oops, which then you've got an electronic panel that you can set and it's got a thermocouple which actually uh, measures the temperature. But again, those can go wrong. They can misfire and you can have problems. But this is the kiln setter, and again, this little cone that I always talk about, the cone, that's formulated to melt at a certain temperature, and when that little cone, or that little finger drops down, it turns off the kiln by dropping that panel, because on the outside, this claw is the other end of that little bar. And so when that comes up, that drops down and turns off the kiln. This just kind of gives you a visual for the temperature range. You know red hot is hot white hot is even hotter. Our bisque cone is around in here in the yellow. The lighter yellow is more our glazed cone temperature. These are our actual temperatures. Approximately uh, for our bisque it's 1944 degrees approximately. Um, that's Fahrenheit and then approximately 2200 for our glazed temperature. So hopefully at this point you can say that you recognize that there are different types of kilns and they do yield different types of results. Depending on the type of fuel used, um, you may have different results because of the amount of oxygen present. Again, those different types of atmospheres. Whether it's um, an oxidation kiln where oxygen is present the entire time or a reduction kiln where there's not enough oxygen for the flame to burn, which changes color, especially of copper glazes. Hopefully you understand now that when the cone melts, the little finger drops down and the cone will turn off the kiln. And hopefully all of this kind of explains the basic um, concepts in kiln firing. So hope that helps.